Hi guys, welcome to the Guitar Show. I am here again um, with James Ingham, my good friend. How you doing, James? I'll be all right one day. Fantastic, that's what I like to hear. When my ship comes in, it'll probably be the Titanic, but. And we're, today we're going to be, uh, James, we're going to be talking about the amazing, the great, legendary um, Davy Graham. Davy, yeah. You know, I suppose. Say, so, first uh, thing, go he's got this name. Davy Graham, I always forget it. I'm, I'm, I'm always telling people, oh, yeah, I'm influenced by this guy called, um, oh, what's his name? <laughs> well, John Renborn, whenever he spoke about Davy, he'd say, well, he's the man. He's the man. None of us would be doing this without Davy. None of us. The other thing about Davy is, is it's D-A-V-E-Y or just D-A-V-Y. It's a bit like Keith Richards and Keith Richard. And I think that um, D-A-V-Y was how it was spelt in the 60s, but he wanted to reintroduce the E. I'm not saying he dabbled with um, drugs on the dance scene. But he wanted to reintroduce the E back into his name. And that's how the family liked to spell it. So that's how I'm spelling it. <laughs> and um, I like to get these things right. He preferred to have the E there. It's like um, Bert Janch. It's meant to be pronounced Janch, but Bert pronounced it with a J, so that's that's how I'm going to pronounce it too. So Fantastic. on we go. <laughs> on we go. But yeah, so, David Graham. People used to say, oh, yeah, David Gray. You mean, no, no, I don't mean David Gray. <laughs> so what we're going to do, uh, James, we're going to talk about his origins first. Let's start at the beginning. So the, the first mm. interesting thing is that his mother was uh, Guyanese, which is a small country. In, mm. cause, you know, my father was from South America, so... Um, okay. You know, there's um, I think it's called French Guyana or something because there's a yeah. Ghana obviously in in Africa. Yeah. Guyana is in South America near Brazil. I think it's right mm. at the top. Mm. It's a place mm. where you get anacondas and incredible spiders. Mm. And I was actually once offered a gig there. Yeah. And, I, and stupidly, I didn't do it, and I, I I've turned it down. I don't know why on earth I did, but you'd probably but, still be there with about a hundred children by now. Yeah. yeah. So so he was actually he was half Guyanese and half English. Mm. No. Well, it's, it's Scottish, actually. Scottish, sorry. I'm going to get pedantic. His father was a Scot and his mother, yeah, was from Ghana. I remember that, um, I think his, his, his Holly, who he married in, I guess, 1970-something, early 70s, she tried cutting his hair once. He kept his hair very short at a time when everyone else was growing their hair really long in the 60s. And people used to say, you know, this, this really incongruous guy would appear dressed in a you know sort of dinner jacket almost really looking great but the hair was always really short whenever he grew his hair it was really natty right so that's that again would that's suggestive of uh, sort of yeah his background yeah. and his, his mum and she tried cutting his hair holly tried cutting his hair and it was just mad it was wild it was impossible to get the scissors and it was i remember one night when he was playing at um in london in a little club he turned up with a really awful hat i mean i've got some shockers but he had a terrible hat on and it's because he'd been for a head a haircut i've got the worst haircut i've ever had and i'm not going to let anyone see it so that's why i'm wearing this stupid hat you know it's like with nail almost this stupid hat um no one could cut his hair <laughs> so uh, we're yeah. gonna we're gonna fast forward to like when he first started you know picking up the guitar and I, I want to mm. mention, mention to you, I don't know if you, 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 you must know because you're such a knowledgeable guy, but there's a guy called Steve Benbow. Steve, Steve Benbow. Benbo. Steve Benbow, Benbo, yeah. sorry. So there you go. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he, he actually, um, he was, um, you know, somebody who kind of took folk guitar from kind of the strumming style to more of a, yeah. you know, more of a soloist style. And he, he was kind of a little bit, maybe 10 years older than David Graham and, and and he kind of showed David Graham his first chords, you know, and and mm. this is an interesting thing is is Steve Benbow had a, was in the army, and um, could speak four languages, including like Mauritanian and Creole or something, mm. and and he'd actually been to Egypt and and he told, he kind of uh, instilled this notion of 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 kind of bringing influences from different mm. musical you know um, ethnicities mm. to David Graham, and I think that's why David Graham. I'm going to quote you now what Steve Benbow said. He said, "Yeah, Davy, this kid used to sit in the corner at rehearsals and watch." Says Benbow, and every so often he'd say, "Could you show me that chord?" And of course yeah. we did. We had yeah. no idea he'd become so good. It was unbelievable what happened. He went away to Morocco, came back and blew a hole through everyone. 
That's that's very true. That's very true. I I I saw Steve. Oh goodness me! It must be it's over ten years. He's probably in the mid noughties I went to a place. I think it was in Chiswick one night, and he he had a pub gig, and he was there with his wife. And uh, there weren't that many people that that Davey really deferred to and looked mm -hmm. up to his whole life. I think Diz Disley was one person that he was in awe of mm -hmm. as a player. Um, and the other one was Steve. I remember him, him saying to me, you know, if you haven't heard of Steve Benbow, you want your head examined. <laughs> it it's was actually, years. It's actually true, because I'm just sorry to interrupt you. Mm. But Steve Benbow lived in Acton, because I lived in Hounslow uh, at the, uh, around that time. And um, But he died, I think, around the time you saw him, like a year after you saw him. It wasn't long afterwards. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine, a percussionist, Wendy Welder, took me there one night. And I... It's all a bit hazy. <laughs> it was a hazy night, but it was a great night. And I, Steve was telling me that, because um, I mentioned Davy to him, and he said, oh, no. Davy at that point in his life, was ringing them up at sort of three in the morning and just talking. Non like, you know, we didn't understand a word he was saying. He, he just decided to ring people up. And um, he, he, he retained that love and respect and admiration for Steve right up to the end. And like I said, there weren't that many people that really impressed him. Um, you know, people would talk about Bert and and John Renborn, and but I think Dave Davey, you know, he think he knew that without him they wouldn't have done what they were doing. You know, he, he someone was talking about one of Bert's mad, magnificent instrumentals, and he said, "Well, you should listen to this tape of me in 1966. And if Bert can play like that, then I'm a Dutch uncle." <laughs> <laughs> and Bert and John would definitely agree. Yeah, Davey's Davey was the guy. I, the story I heard, because I think he grew up, um, he was born um, miles away, because his mother was evacuated. <clears throat> I think the house was bombed, actually. That's right, the house was bombed. And he, so she was evacuated. He was, he was in the womb, and, and, the, and the, bomb took a, the, the house took an almost direct hit. I'm probably getting this all wrong, but there was a documentary that I was taking part in, which I hope will see the light of day soon. Um, and so the director took me all the way up to Davy's birthplace in Leicester, Leicestershire, and I was expecting some horrible dump, and it was almost like a palace. Um, beautiful old building, which is now a very posh hotel, but it was a place where, you know, people, mums could go and give birth safely away from the bombs of the Blitz. Davy was born November 1940, and uh, so, yeah, his mum was evacuated there. Um, he was born there and then grew up in fairly considerable poverty. She had, um, he had a half brother, Nicholas, um, younger brother and sister, his sister, Jill. Uh, it gets, it, the, the family tree is quite complicated, but I know that um, it's the first time he saw a guitar. His childhood friend, John Miller, was telling me, and this is, I'm rambling away about this, but it's its quite an interesting story because John Miller and Davey grew up together, got up to a lot of hijinks as kids um, around the Labrook Grove area. And at that time it was, you know, you, no one can really afford to live there now. <laughs> but at the time it was slums almost. So he and Davey and his friend John would sort of get go around the streets of Notting Hill. And Davey was quite tall, even when he was young. So he'd, he'd go and buy cigarettes. He could buy a packet of woodbines and get away with it when he was about 12, 13 years old. And the streets were lit with gaslight you know, lampposts, right? Do you want to tell everyone what and woodbines are? To the they're American, cigarettes. They're, they're American friends. <clears throat> cheap cigarettes, I guess. So he'd buy a packet of woodbines and he'd have nothing to light them with. And so John Miller was telling me that Davey would literally, he was so athletic, he'd shin up the lamppost right to the top and light the cigarette from the flame at the top of the lamppost and then shin right the way down. He was so athletic, he, he could do a somersault and just remain st just out of the blue, just somersault, complete somersault and land on his feet and carry on walking. <laughs> because he, he always looked, he gave the impression that he was in the army because of his short hair in the 60s. Everybody had long hair, but he had short hair. And so yeah. he just looked like he was, he was quite a, almost well, he, like an authoritarian sort of character, you know? He could be quite imposing in that way. I remember, um, I remember he, talking to him once and trying to be all cool and leaning up against a wall outside the club. And I was asking him something. Stand up straight when you're talking to me. Shoulders back. 
what's the matter with you? You know, oh God. <laughs> and so right away, you're sort of on edge. But um, yeah, John Miller, his father, I think, was a, was a doctor. And Davey was going to be a surgeon, wanted to be a surgeon. But Davey was always getting into fights, I guess. There's a famous piece of film of him from the early 80s. Um, he's got a shiner. He's got a black eye. And um, it, I'm sure there was something. There's a story behind that. He maintained he was just meditating under a table and stood up too quickly. But I think I think not. But no, he was he, he got into a fight when he was I think he was at the, the Lycee in South Kensington as a lad and got into an altercation with another student and ended up with a pencil through his eye, went right into the pupil. Right. So he was blind. He was blinded in one eye. Mm -hmm. And um, so that that prevented him from becoming a surgeon. They were all going to go to the seaside one day mm -hmm. and Davy had clocked Dr. Miller's guitar in the corner. And Dr. Miller said, oh, you like the look of that? And he took it down and he played him a bark, a piece of bark or something on the guitar. Mm -hmm. They were all going to go off to the seaside together. And Davy said, do you mind if I just stay here? What? No, I, I wanted to stay here. By the time they got back from their day trip, he could play the piece of music. Is, is this the, the audio that you sent me? No. You, you oh, said... that's... no. No, no, no. This, this was something that he learned. He, he would play bark pieces. Mm -hmm. Um, which again, a lot of the guitarists in the sixties picked up on that. This guy yeah. playing Bach on the guitar, Paul McCartney famously learnt the same piece that Davy used to play, and it evolved into Blackbird. Because right? you that know, style of finger picking. So Davy influenced people. There was usually a point of connection between him. It was like Donovan taught the Beatles how to finger pick, but Donovan got and and Bert and Nick Drake. They all got their stuff from Davy. Yeah. Um, I want to say um, that really, if so many people have sort of been influenced by him and, and never really mentioned him. The but without knowing it. Yeah, but the obvious is Jimmy Page, mm. of course. <laughs> the obvious oh, there's is something Jimmy wrong Page. with the audio here. I can't quite hear what you said. <laughs> there's no need to sweat. No, I, I don't know. I think it's pretty well documented. And it's yeah. kind of, um, she moved through the fair and, and, and Black Waterside, which, you know, I don't really need to point out the bleeding obvious, do I? But, you know, but I think a lot of people were because, my, you know, even my mum said when she was, my mum was a real hippie and she yeah. did everybody, but everybody that started guitar, literally the first songs they'd learn would be House of the Rising Sun and Angie. That's, I think that's true. And, um, yeah, Angie was, was a real lady and she was Davy's friend. They loved each other. They were really, really close. And um, and it became this. It was such such a hauntingly lovely piece of music, isn't it? I think it's my favourite piece of guitar music. Can you play a little bit? Um, Can well, you play us a little. Yeah. Bit? The thing about Angie was that he'd never play. He would refuse to play it. He'd get oh, really? asked to play it, and one night he was, you know, will you play Angie? No, no, I'm not playing Angie. Oh, please, no, no, don't ask me to play that. It's not fair. And I thought, that's an interesting comment. And I found out years later that she died pretty much the year before. And he, it really upset him. And I think he's, he always loved that girl. They were, they were like this. They used to knock around together a lot. Mm -hmm. And she was just this lovely, lovely. And she's a friend of the family. The family all loved her. And so she was a real person. And this is what you forget. You know, people used to ask Essie Roji to sing My Lovely Elizabeth. And he didn't want to because it... It, it was a true story about being jilted and it upset him so much he didn't want to sing it but angie's um it's just that descending bass line and um very simple mm -hmm. but um davy used to have a go at anyone that played it like bert which because davy would go to Can you and use his, up? Yeah, can you lift the guitar? Use, up? It, he'd use his finger for the bass note, whereas everyone else would use their thumb and and go to an, an E minor instead of an E major. That's so, so um, Bert, Bert's was more. So there were the hammer-ons that that Davy hated. People yeah. kind of go. You know, it would get very kind of violent and 
and thrashing and Bert's version. <laughs> Bert's first Bert heard it. Um, in fact, Bert was taught to play the guitar by Davy's sister Jill Doyle, who worked in the Troubadour Club in Earl's Court. So, let, let's go back a bit. So it's all very incestuous. So, so, so Bert I think, Yanks, do, you, do you want to give a bit of context about Bert Yanks? Where, where, where was he born? He's he a, a Scots, a Scotsman, and um, so there's the Scottish connection. Um, it's all it's almost like a family i was reading about bob marley and bunny whaler and how they ended up being related through you know various there are various points of connection i know that davy's davy's niece cindy lives in notting hill and her father's actually archie fisher who was a scottish folk singer. it's all everyone seemed to know each other and there was a clique and so Angie was a piece that, Day, that that Bert would have heard and just learnt his own version of, and it's almost like Chinese whispers. Well, they played together you... a lot, didn't they, Bert and Davy? Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, do you mean the documentary they made? It was it in two oh at the very end. Well, I, yeah, that's that was nice watching them play together. And um, Davy was very much past his best at the time, but um, there was a whole scene, and and you'd get to hear about each other. And so John Renborn. Um, he wanted to get involved in Soho and that part of London was, was the hub. And Davy was sort of a bit of a, a legend with Jones. Uh, there's so much to cover here, but with Angie, I think it was, it was like a piece of music that Davy wrote, he was very fond of. And then I suppose it's like you've given birth to a child that then is adopted at birth. And every now and then you'll see your child wandering around somewhere dressed in clothes that you don't really like and you don't approve of the way that the hair's being done. Angie was a piece of music that loads of people would play their own different versions of. And Davy was very, oh, you've got that wrong. It doesn't go like that. Don't use your thumb. No, not like that. No, that's the way Bert does it. And he had his own specific way, but he never played it. He only played it once. There was only one time I saw him play Angie. And um, released in 1962. That's, you know, it's a, well, it was, quite... it was on it. Yeah, it was, I think he was working with Alexis Corner. Um, and they that was when there were so many gigs around. Davy would, would play in a restaurant in Earl's Court. He had a residency there at Nick's Diner. Um and there were so many gigs. I think that he and he and Alexis used to work together. Davy was was even in an early version of John Mayles Blues Breakers, you know, going way, way back, playing a bit of guitar. And I think there was one there was one story I heard where Alexis was so busy that he double booked himself. So Davy went and played Alexis's gig for him hmm. as Alexis Corner. <laughs> and they both they both listened to Brunzi and they 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 both sang in a similar style. And I think I don't know if it's true, but it's a lovely story. And then so that was that EP, I think was it called Three Four A D? Yes. And Angie was on that. And I think he'd written it in Paris. I think there's a part because Davy was travelling all over the place when most people were struggling to get out of their own towns and he'd, he'd, been so he, he'd done it. Yeah. I mean, he'd been to Algeria and Morocco, which is really important because this mm. is where the, the whole, um, if I get my guitar, this is where the whole, uh, dad gad yeah. sort of thing comes from. And cause really what I, I first heard that this is kind of the first, kind of first heard that yeah or i heard yeah. angie even and and i was just like wow where you know where did that come from and and also he'd do the whole thing where he would <laughs> that whole thing the drone yeah yeah you know with the um lydian you know all these kind of and, and apparently he went to morocco he went to algeria you know, mm. was playing with Oud players. Mm. And, you know, he must have just experimented. You know, maybe he yeah, he, de an hour he developed and... he developed that tuning, Dadgad, to to you know facilitate <clears throat> the playing of that kind of stuff. Mm. And yeah, I think if you're a trailblazer or you you know you're at the point of the arrow, it's quite a lonely place. And then you, you you've kicked the door open, and then everyone else follows in behind you and innovates and develops. And I mean, yeah. I think it's worth pointing out that he died in poverty. And he'd had to sell his last guitar. Now, and, and he did to say, did you see him ever perform in the? It was some a Chinese restaurant or some kind of an Asian restaurant. 
and he had little he had a residency apparently this was his last gig he was playing in some so or maybe that was before the documentary but he was literally pay, playing for next to no money in some kind of a chinese restaurant in soho you know the, you know in the, mm -hmm. it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me i didn't see him for, for years and years but i think that you know he it's a shame that he he didn't get the recognition i think a bit of a bit of money for some of those um zeppelin songs you know the arrangements were so specific and unique and exact he would take the template of an old folk song um like <laughs> she moved through the fair but yeah. what he did with it was it was virtually yeah. his own piece of music yeah. and um you know i mean he could have he could have ended up with robbie williams as a neighbor it could have been worse you know poor jimmy's page but um <laughs> but you know, really life de life deals us some terrible blows doesn't it but you know, I, I think he probably he probably could have done with a bit more recognition and a bit of wedge for it, you know, a bit of money, you know. Because w without him, you wouldn't have got guys, dare I say, like Richard Thompson. And the thing is, as well, mm -hmm. is is there's a really funny YouTube. There's an interview with and and Jimmy Page is kind of <laughs> doing all this stuff, and and mm. the interviewer says, "Oh, where did you come up with that stuff? How did you get that stuff? Where did you learn it from?" Mm. And Jimmy Page could have just said then. David Graham, but he didn't. Yeah, he didn't yeah, say he I didn't know. Say anything. It was such a shame because it was he had many opportunities to say, "I got this from David Graham. This well, is a lift off David." Graham. You know, you know. Uh, it's a ser somebody that's a serial something or other. That we don't have to talk about him really, do we? Um, so yeah, the poor old Davy. <sighs> he was somebody that I before the internet, you hadn't heard of him. I I started finger picking. I'd been learning the guitar for about 10 years and I think I'd, I'd got into the kind of... You know, all of that stuff. Beautiful, beautiful. Man. I, no, it's, I, I just, I wanted to kind of, I was at a loose end and I, I, I remember really vividly, you talk about Angie, the first time I heard the piece of music, I was crossing Leicester Square en route to se roji's place and i you know i, I just was crossing up because there were loads of record shops and guitar shops around that that neck of the woods back then and there was a guy busking and he was playing stuff like that so i stopped and then i actually i had a little walkman and i recorded him playing and he played angie and i'd never heard i knew it like i was saying about those peter green songs I've, i know this well who is this and i played it to my my guitar tutor beautiful brian god rest his soul and he he said well that's angie I said, really? Okay, <laughs> Davy Graham. And I said, well, who's Davy Graham? And I'd, I'd once asked Brian, who played... What do you mean, dear the... fellow? You don't know Davy Graham? Well, he was, me. he was very similarly to, yeah, to, to Peter Green. He was, he'd acquired this mythological status. And is he still alive? Has he lost it completely? Where is he? Who is he? Is he? He'd, 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 he'd acquired this mythological status and Brian played me a piece of music called 40 Ton Parachute, which was Davy, and I just, it just, oh my God. Um, and I went and found a copy in Collets, you know, that music shop that Dave Peabody was working in. Yeah, yeah. I, I said, listen, I'm trying to get hold of some Davy Gray and stuff. And they just, there was no, rec there were no records, all these records that, you know, Folk Blues and Beyond and Midnight Man, and you couldn't get any of them. That's a classic. If, if you're a guitar player and you don't have that album, more fool you well the thing the thing about the early 90s was that you couldn't you couldn't buy it anywhere um new it wasn't available there was a compilation that had just come out called folk blues and all points in between and that was bits and dave peabody said well it's it's most of folk blues and beyond and some other bits mm -hmm. and it had a, a picture of a very emaciated looking guy in the late 60s <laughs> and i didn't realize at the time this was at the height of his heroin addiction right so I went home and listened to this and it was not like I was expecting it at all. You know, it wasn't what I was expecting. This was not someone that was singing the blues in a kind of American accent. It was, um, you'd get the lead belly kind of tune, but you'd get something, I'm leaving, leaving mama and I don't know where to go. You know, very kind of English sounding guy, not frightened to just sing in his own voice. And there was something quite military about it. It was very, very um, powerful playing. And then you get these Indian ragas and all this stuff going on. And I spotted that he was playing somewhere. And it, I don't know if he'd been playing. He, I, apparently he taught guitar. So I took myself up to a gig 
and that's when I first met him. It was at the Black Horse in Rathbone Place, which was an old, I think it's a burger bo burger joint now. But it was upstairs at a pub, and it had been a folk club since the 60s, and a lot of those places like Bungie's were still, were still there, you know, the old folk cellars. They hadn't completely butchered and destroyed the place like they have now. So it was still possible to get catch the kind of sunset of the 60s folk boom. Um, and he was playing there. And I was expecting to see this wizened guy, you know, very pale looking. And I thought, well, it's 1991, 92 now, whenever it was. He must be really like, you know, blow on him and he'll fall over. He's probably nothing to him. I was expecting this really sort of um, pale, emaciated guy. And there was this bronzed, tanned, muscular mm. in a, and he was wearing a tracksuit, skimpy t-shirt and sandals. Absolutely nothing like I was expecting. He looked great. He was probably about the age I am. He was early 50s. And he played really well. He played, he played great. And, um, but people were a little bit intimidated. I didn't want to talk to him almost afterwards. I thought he cut a lonely figure just sitting there. And I thought, well, I'm, I'd heard all these things about him. He's crazy. And I'd asked John, I tell you, <laughs> the guy I asked was John Renborn, who I'd got to know. I, I used to love going and seeing John. Um, and I love the Pentangle records. And, you, um, you have a photo with him, don't you? You, you sent me. Um, probably up there. Yeah, I think I probably, is there's this probably what, a couple. I'm going to be, am I going to be Essex now and, and get the wrong photo? Is that, he and I used to, oh, that's, that yeah, that, that's an early one. That's me. That's at the half moon in Putney. Right. I look like I've got, um, um, a little pixie coming out of my head there. I think that might be the first time I met John and I'm look I'm 20 years old there with lots of hair. I had the pleasure I think of there's... seeing him, um, seeing him perform. My my good friend Tim Pels, who's who's kind of my uh, my boss mm -hmm. on one of the, the gigs I do, and uh, mm. he he got him in. And um, my friend Tim is a great classical guitarist, as well as many okay. other things. And you know, the guy's a genius mm. on guitar. Mm. John Rembrandt, genius. Well, John, John, I think got his first sort of foot in the door as a player by listening to Davy, and I remember. I, I said to him after a, after a gig, I said, "Look, I'm, I, I need to learn. Can you can you teach me?" He said, "Well, I live in Devon. I'd love to teach you." I said, "Well, do you think I should try and go and see Davy Graham?" He said, "Oh, Davy, yeah, yeah, man, yeah, you should go and see Davy, Davy." And he and he, he looked at me now. This glint in his eye, John Rembrandt. He said, "Um, he's a bit nutty, <laughs> like that." But it wasn't. It, it was said not. It was said not like a warning. It was more of an endorsement. You know, he's a bit nutty. You know, like you'll have <laughs> this will be fun. He was almost like Rick Mail. He's a bit nutty. <laughs> but um, I think that was his way of saying that, you know, if you go for guitar lessons, I know people that went for guitar lessons with Davey and he'd just put a record on and go to the pub. <laughs> you know, he, I, I, those legendary stories about he'd turn up for a gig with a dog on a piece of string and to an all-nighter at the Cousins. And he'd come on and he'd, he'd spend, you know, ages explaining, I'm looking after this dog for a dear friend of mine who's a, you know, blah, 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 blah. He wouldn't play a note. and <laughs> He'd just talk about the dog and that'd That's be it. Time. Okay, <laughs> great. Nice, Davey. Lovely. But yeah, <clears throat> so I went and saw, I went and saw Dave and I just went and I thought, well, I'm just going to talk to him. And uh, he signed the album and had a chat. And he gave me his number. I remember saying, I said, oh, do you have a piece of paper? I said, well, just write it on the sleeve. Oh, surely not, you know. So he gave me his phone number and I used to give him a call every now and then. And I I was asking him where he was playing one night and he told me about a place called the Soul's Arms, which is long gone. Mm -hmm. It was um, it was near Warren Street Tube, I think. And he was, he was somebody that wouldn't just give you directions to a place. He, there'd have to be a lovely story attached to it. But of course, you know, the, the Soul's Arms, if you, what you must do when you're up there is go down Drummond Street because there's a delicatessen there that serves the finest selection of Adriatic condiments in London or the Southeast. I don't, what? You know, I should have been taking notes, you know. Everything was wonderful with him. There was something to, there was something to enjoy in everything. And um, I never did get to the place where the Adriatic condiments <laughs> were being sold, but he could never answer a question straight. You talk to him about something, and I had the savvy to to just listen. I realised I wasn't going to be, but you know, when someone's so intelligent, 
you don't meet that people that whose minds are like that. I've been looking at uh, you know he was like the Sherlock Holmes character in the Benedict Cumberbatch where he's he'll read somebody and he'll just be able to describe everything about them and he'll just go into one. Mm. And you, you've got to be writing it down because there's no way I could I could spar with him. His knowledge, his reading, the stuff that he read, you know, you just would listen. And I so wished I'd recorded it, you know. So James, let's talk a little bit about his career. Tell me about his career. Where where was he going uh, when you met him? You know, mm. uh, what you know? Just tell us, you know, what how I th- maybe you knew, because and I just want to go back to the '60s just first of all mm. because <clears> I want to tell you about Paul Simon, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I grew up in Colchester, Essex. I'm from Essex. I'm an Essex lad, 100%. Essex. Oh, you'll have to tell me about Colchester. I think my son Joseph's going to be uh, moving there, and he's not very happy about it. It's <laughs> a nightmare. It, there's t- there's 10 men to one woman in Colchester. He he didn't mean it, Joseph. It's going to be great. I just want to say, Joe, there's 10 Honest. men. There's 10 men, because it's a garrison town, yeah? It's a garrison. <laughs> so there's 10 men to one woman, okay? Think about that. Think about that. So anyway, uh, let's poor play. Joe. That's that's going to be a great place to turn eighteen. <laughs> Brilliant. Trust me, I may as well have been a monk when I was there. Yeah. Um, I'll have to kidnap him. <laughs> so anyway, um, basically, uh, in, in, um, Paul Simon had a surrogate mother in Colchester. So w- before Simon okay. and Garfunkel, that whole thing, he came over. I, I don't know what the whole story, but he apparently came to England to you know play folk music and to you know just to do the travel thing you know and Mm -hmm. he went around a lot of clubs a lot of folk clubs and he actually went to played in colchester at folk clubs you know and and he had a Mm. surrogate mother there who i think he even visited not long ago when before she died this is probably 20 years but anyway he went into london and he went into the famous club where davy graham was He, he played at the troubadour yeah davy davy was really impressed you know, he said he, he sang like a like an angel. He was beautiful. You, you know, you could hear a pin drop. And I I do think that there was a point where he was thinking of working with Davy, and they had some meeting in a hotel somewhere. But I think I think Paul Simon had heard that Davy had started you know experimenting with heroin, and I think that that kind of ruined a lot of things for Davy. The the momentum that he'd picked up. And a lot of his friends were just distraught, you know. Um, Alexis Corner was appalled when he found out that Davy had decided to experiment with heroin. Um, his, his old friend John Miller was again appalled. And Paul Simon, I think that kind of put an end to any idea of, of them collaborating. But he did, you know, he, he did record Angie, didn't he? Oh, yeah. I, he came back, he came back from his, his trip to the UK with Angie and giving full credit to Davy Graham. And I think that's what kept Davy able to eat. He'd get, you know, lump sums, you know, royalties. Um, he which, bought is what Jimmy, bro- which is what Jimmy Page should have done. I know. Well, if, the thing about these royalties was he was very generous with them. And he, he didn't really get on with his brother Nicholas, but he did buy him a jewellery shop after he'd got one of these royalty payments wow. in Paddington. Yeah, and I think that Davy's brother apparently used to do a deal with a local funeral. But I shouldn't mention anything about jewellery. Um, but no, he didn't really click with his brother Nick, but he he had a conscience. He did, he did have a conscience, and they they really butted heads as, as children. And <clears throat> I, I've, I've seen them together, and they didn't really... They rubbed each other up the wrong way. They really did, but there was some familial love there i guess you know he had, he was generous with his money you know so so talking about his career so he's playing the troubadour in the 60s this is yeah. just before the start of the whole Jimi hendrix coming in and eric clapton big boom where did his mm. career go after that where, uh, to the point where you well i think that you know it's his it was his sister's idea that he play at the troubadour jill and then everyone started to go down there and play and um he recorded a couple of really magnificent records. You mentioned this this chap. Yep. I don't know how he's. I'm gonna to have to take this out of its sleeve. This is signed, by the way, so I've got to be really careful with it. Uh, there's your folk blues and beyond. It's the album that everyone should own by decades. So did he record that in West West Hampstead? Because that's near me where I am now, West Hampstead. It was Near-ish. recorded for it was recorded for Decca. So I wonder can if you read it was that. This, I want yes. I wish it's James David Graham. I wonder yeah. if it was recorded that in was, Hampstead. I think it probably would have been. And um, 
on the Decca label. Whoops, back in the day. And it followed it up with um, things like this one here. And that was still Decca, so he was a Decca signer. A lovely evoke. So he was, he was signed to Decca for a few years. I don't know if these records sold really great. He did a collaboration it's a big deal. with Shirley. It's a big deal. Did a collaboration with Shirley Collins, which oh, classic. Yeah, the, the, you just add double bass and drums to that, and you got Pentangle. Right. Really, you know, the, um, I think he launched a lot of great careers, but I think the problem really was the heroin in the late sixties when he started to experiment with that. And I think it was just, as Martin Carthy said, it was Bye Bye Davy for a few years. Can I just say, do you think it was because of, he, you know, he was really influenced by blues, Big Bull Brunzi and all those guys. Do you think also that could have been because of his love of Charlie Parker? Maybe yeah, he yeah. That Charlie Parker went, and there was a misconception in the 60s. There was no jazz education then. So mm -hmm. kind of people actually thought, even Eric Clapton thought this, that if you took heroin, you'd know how to play jazz. It yeah, would put it's, you in that, it, you know. It's absolute rubbish, and a lot of people have, have fallen into that. Unbelievable people like Charlie Watts in the 80s. You never would have thought, and luckily he made it through. I love Charlie. And, Charlie um, Watts, the drummer. From yeah, the I, I know. Unbelievable. I should think, I, this isn't really fair to say that, but he got through it, but it was one of those things that, mm -hmm. um, and I think Charles Mingus as well, who, who Davey loved, Charlie Mingus, better get it in your soul. Um, he got me listening to Charlie Mingus. So it was one of these things he picked up. And I think, unfortunately, it, it, I don't know too much about it. it gets in your system and it becomes impossible to. I think he dabbled with 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 all sorts of things, LSD and it? mescaline. And... Did he get off? Heroin? He, he got off the heroin in about 1969 and he went back to live with his mum and started giving guitar lessons mm -hmm. to pull himself together. I don't think he had a record deal anymore. I could be wrong about that, but I, I think the Decca deal had. A lot of people had taken what he'd started and run with it, and he'd kind of been left behind. Um, and that's it, it was while he was staying with his mum in the late 60, 1969, he, he met Holly, who was a visiting American, lovely, lovely woman. Hi, Holly, we love you. She's going to watch this, I'm sure. You'd be like, it'd be nice for you to speak to her. Mm, and, I'd um, love to. I'd love to. She, turned, she saw an ad for a guitar lesson. I promise I won't it, interrupt. <laughs> No, was, I think she she saw an ad for a guitar teacher at the Electric Cinema or whatever it's called on the Portobello Road, and she she went round to the house and there was Davy, and they had a lesson and um, I think she made a real impression on him, because she was she's really smart, really fun, and just a joy. She's a joy to be with that woman, and I think that something ha he fell in love with her basically, and he let off some fireworks in the back garden in her honour, at the end of the lesson. Pew! up into the sky bam mm -hmm. and they didn't see each other for a few weeks and he ran into her in a shop on portobello road and said it's you it's you i think that he was so pleased and they got together um and she got him out of london away from the temptations of the city the drugs you know all of that whole scene mm -hmm. and they moved down to deal for a while to stay with davy's sister on the south coast and then ended up in sandwich in kent running a little folk club at St. Mary's Church. Sandwich. There. And that, yeah, that was a good time in his life. I holidayed there when I was a kid. Do you know it? Uh, sandwich. Is there a place called Sandwich? There's a place called Sandwich. And there's, a, there's also a place called, there's also a place called Beer. And uh, if you get a stick of rock there, it says this is the only rock with beer running through all the way through it. Because it says beer on it. Right? Oh. But Sandwich is a lovely place. And, and I think that they lived a very clean, healthy, lovely lifestyle. Mm -hmm. They loved each other. They adored each other. But I think a lot of Davies, um, mental health issues caught up with him and again this is where we're straying into someone else's private life yeah but she she ended up having to leave i think her mum sent her a one-way ticket back to the states mm -hmm. and she was just going to visit right um but she went back and she didn't come back and um they didn't this, get divorced did, was this angie, though? <clears throat> this is angie no 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 this no no this is holly this is holly sorry holly and davy recorded a couple of albums together the holly kaleidoscope being one mm -hmm. and and it was just a lovely partnership. It really worked and they remained really, really close for the rest of his life. She told me that he used to phone her up with and he'd play her a piece of music in the middle of the night mm -hmm. and ask her a question and, you know, they chatted and chatted. They didn't see each other again for many, many years, 20 years at least, by which time she'd, she'd had a kid and married someone else and or got together with someone else. You'd have to, you've got to talk to her. She's great. But that was probably the only time of stability in his life. And so suddenly she was gone. And he ended up um, checking himself into a mental hospital. 
in uh, in North London just to get some treatment. And unfortunately, as Peter Green discovered, they both ended up having ECT. You know, the electro. Yeah. I mean, that's curtains, isn't it? Really, isn't bloody it? awful. And I I think that he really tackled his recovery from drugs addictively and he was telling me that he did so many um press ups yeah i've read about these people do them i do but i he, do press ups i bet i know you do well look at you you've only got to look at no, you to no, know no, how no, healthy no, you're no. super hey. healthy <laughs> hey man you're it's ripped that, no no but if I, I just do press i don't i don't do the gym or any of that no right. i think davy was ripped as if well as being mind. ripped as well as being ripped off as well as being ripped off davy was ripped <laughs> but um no, one of his friends, you know, his, his childhood friend turned up to see him and he said he turned into the Incredible Hulk. But he said that he damaged the nerves in his arms because he overdid it. So he could never play, he could never play as fast again. No, what, you, what I do, I get two dumbbells. And yeah. I put my hand there and then you use the dumbbells and that's, then you can keep your wrist straight. Yeah. Little tip for okay. guitar players doing press-ups. This is it. Well, Davey always maintained that the nerve damage to his system from drugs was one thing, but the nerve damage done by too many... Uh, you know, press-ups, press up, sit-ups, um, was, um, but yeah, like when I met him in the, in the early nineties, he'd come through this whole scene. He, he, he had a place in, in Camden for years. And I think she kept the place open for them when they moved down to the South coast. And when the marriage failed and he came back to London, his lovely landlady, you know, he, she'd held the place open for him. So he stayed there for the rest of his life, pretty much, um, in Lime street in Camden, there was a pub at the end of the road. And that's where he, you know, he record, he, he'd recorded an album when I met him called Playing in Traffic because he'd been trying to, you know, practice and make music and there was like a building site. They were already starting to do what they've done with, with Camden and he was just, all he could hear the whole time was drills and, you know, the noise. But he seemed really in good shape when I saw him. And um, so he suggested to me that he was going to get a residency in Denmark Street in the early 90s and Andy's guitar shop which is now Hanks you know Denmark Street it's yeah. right at the end of the road yeah yeah it's that red that that little red shop on the end with the little yeah. alleyway that used to be there the name. I think they've actually changed the name of that now it probably well Andy was yeah. the guy that ran it for years and then ran away mm. I don't know where he is now I, mean, I hope he's all right but it was an amazing was bit... shop it was an amazing shop uh, on three those, floors yeah it had all those old um, Japanese and old English guitars and I tell you what when I went there this is so another anecdote when i went there um that band um the libertines had just been in mm -hmm. remember the libertines this is this yeah. is going about ages yeah and they just been in and they nicked a guitar and they were really angry in there they were really pissed off mm. and saying oh the libertines have just been in and nicked the guitar right i'm calling the manager up now to the libertines manager to get the guitar back <laughs> that's um taking bleeding libertines isn't it mm. <laughs> oh dear dear god help me but no well davy used to hang out in there as well and i think that there was a, a medieval forge building at the back um that was just used to store things in and andy was using it as a storeroom and he was taking a look around there and he decided maybe it'd be a fun place for us to just jam the people that worked in the shop after we've closed the shop on a friday night and this just evolved into a club and it was tiny. I mean, this cupboard is small. It was kind of like this back in the day and they called it the Forge. And it later got a license and they expanded it and it became the 12 Bar Club, which amazing, it was there it? until a few years ago. Yeah. But I was there right at the beginning and the first person, Davy, was telling me, you've got to come along. They're starting this club, come along for the first night and see what you think. Mm -hmm. Be a good place for you to, to play. Mm -hmm. And I remember going down there and, um, for me, it'd be a bit like 10 years earlier, being 12, 13 years old and being able to go and spend an evening with John Lennon. I'm not kidding. No, and no. It, was it was bizarre to be in there with four people in the audience and I'd turn up early and there he'd be. Incredible. And I remember just, just going and sitting, sitting with him in this dark black walls with a little, there was a little furnace, uh, sort of fireplacey bit mm -hmm. from where the forge had been. And they, they'd, put a, they'd built a little, a tiny little stage. Um, there and just talking to him about music and and life and did he ever mention and part, part go on sorry <laughs> did he ever no, mention, just did he mention, ever mention anything about can I just say guys yeah uh, I've had a few complaints uh, on my YouTube channel because um, 
when when I'm when I'm because we're not actually in, I'm not interviewing James. We're, we're having a chat, and and when James is talking, I get so excited that I want to I want to come in with something. And apparently, I, I got told off a few times. In, in yeah, no, I've heard I've heard about the complaints you've been getting for getting too excited online and coming in, but we won't go there. Yeah. So, um, did you ever oh, ask him when you were chatting to him? Did you ever ask him about Morocco, or, or did he ever talk about Morocco? Because I, he, well. He he advised. He was telling me what I should do, where I should go. He was always good at giving advice, and he, I think he told me to, you know, Turkey would really suit you. It suit your temperament. It would suit your complexion. You'd like the food, and um, Tunisia is another place you'd you, you'd really enjoy. Tunisia, Been there. beautiful, love it. And again, you know, I like I said, didn't get didn't get south of Croydon. I never. Mm -hmm. I was listening, and part of me is thinking this is David Graham, oh my God. And then part of me is thinking, this is interesting. I really should be taking notes here. Well, can I just you say didn't... this? Because I was very influenced by David Graham and Brian Jones. Mm. I felt that Brian Jones has kind of taken, you know, well, Brian Jones ended up in Morocco and recording um, what was one of the first world music albums, as you know. And yeah. and I kind of followed in their footsteps and I went to Morocco and spent um, a couple of years there, you know, learning the music. And, oh, that's and amazing. Whereabouts really... were you? Everywhere I made, I made an album called Long Road to Tiznit, and that was my favourite place. It was a place called okay. Tiznit in the southern part of Morocco. Okay. And uh, but Marrakesh, I think um, I think uh, Davy went to Tangier, if I recall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, I've been everywhere. You know, Casablanca, um, Tafraut, which are my um, uh, I think I've got a good friend um, as well. Uh, she's an author called Jane Johnson. And okay. she, she wrote many books and she she I met her there and but anyway um the point is is that I felt it's a kind of real British thing to go to Morocco to get to, to learn about other cultures and learn yeah. about music and I, I, I really felt I was following in the footsteps in my very very small way of course of mm. David Graham and Brian Jones and you know what I mean mm. sorry well yeah no no I I, I spent I spent a couple of hours in in Casablanca once in a in a waiting room, waiting for my flight. We weren't allowed out of this waiting room, and all there was was a toilet. I'm not going to go into it, but I got food poisoning when I was in Marrakesh, and it was not a very good experience for me. You, if you go somewhere like that, you have to know someone that lives there that can show you the ropes and tell you don't go here. You should go here. Yeah, I recommend this. I don't recommend that. Like anywhere, man, you've got to you've got to know what you're doing. And I was very young and silly, and I didn't quite know what I was doing. And I, I, I kind of wished I could I could could have gone back with somebody like Davy that would have known. I've got a very funny handwritten note from Keith Richards, who used to drink in the hand in hand with Ronnie Wood, and he just he left this really cryptic note saying, "Go to, go to the fairs in Tangier, round the corner from the El Minza Hotel, and ask for Ahmed." I have still got that <laughs> note. That's and it was probably it's a bit like saying no go to elephant and castle walk around the corner and ask for bill and you'll be all right you'll have a good you know time what, though? you know what though um it's probably true because <laughs> it's um, probably true now there, there was a, a guy called ahmed in the 60s that brian jones used to hang out with he was basically a drug dealer and i think this was keith rich's cheeky way of saying well, you know, you'll have fun if you if you follow my instructions son off yeah. you go and i i didn't i never met ahmed and i never went to the el Minza hotel in tangier but yeah, I kind of, but, I kind of wish I had now. <laughs> David Graham was like, if you talk to any '60s kind of megastar like Clapton or Keith Richards mm -hmm. or any of those guys, they're all going to say, "David Graham, man, that guy was a genius on the guitar." You well, know, I think all the thing is, all... with the music and just with the things he did with his life, he did things so that other people didn't have to. Yeah, he went out there, got the knowledge, and then people, you just, know, you know, and then he was almost the victim of that because everyone armed with all this i mean i was a bit like that when i was younger you know I, and i put the kind of moroccan threads on and i'd have the rings and the mm -hmm. hair and oh, the I, incense I, and all of that I've done looking it. all cool and i remember telling my friends well you know i i know davy graham oh yeah yeah and i i go to this club you know and i bought about 15 of my mates along one night from the pub to come and watch and Davey was standing there in the in the doorway, and this is a good lesson. This is probably the best lesson he ever gave me. Was um, <laughs> I was walking in, and I saw him there, and I had all my friends, my gang, my posse, and I was there in all this, looking really cool with the droopy moustache and all of this nonsense. And I just said, "Oh, Davey, hi." He went, and he looked me up and down, and in front of all my friends, he went, "Don't blame me. Give it up." 
and carried on talking to his friend. And I was like, oh, God. Yeah. It's basically basically saying, don't dress up like this. Yeah. Because he could also tell if I'd been practicing or not. You've not been practicing. You've just been, you know, making yourself look pretty in the mirror. There's no point in doing that yeah. if you're, you know, and, and he actually put his money where his mouth was, as, as it were. He, he, was, he was a he real put, deal, basically. He put the work in and, you know, there was a time when he really did practice diligently. He learned the yeah. classical guitar. That's yeah. something he did in the 70s when, when he wasn't making any records. He decided that the classical guitar was the only way forward and he never would play the steel string. Whenever I saw him, he never played a steel string guitar again. He always played a, cl a classical guitar. Because I saw him on a TV show doing Sunny, you know, which is a pretty, um, you know, it's got some changes in there. And he was yeah. he was doing this crazy, like, uh, you know. Oh, my goodness, yeah. Uh, uh, like the chords and the melody at the same time. You know? it's oh, just, man. Like, it, it's just it's like, what are the... Yeah. I, well, I remember when I was a kid listening to, you know, I'd never touched a guitar and looking at the Beatles and thinking, this is just amazing. This is like, yeah. and it's slightly spoiled when you actually learn to play the guitar, because then you're looking and thinking, oh, that's pretty easy. And to this day, the thing I love about listening to him is there'll be points in his playing where I'll just go, I haven't got a clue what this guy's doing. And I love that. I'm, I'm just enjoying yeah. the, I'm enjoying the music and I'm not worrying about whether I'd be mm. able to play it or but, not, because there comes a point where you think... Mm. This is just, it's way out of my league. I'm never going to be able to play he, that well. He, he brought Dad Gad to the world of guitar. Yeah. He did that, that yeah. Just that one thing would have been enough. You can't patent it. And I'm sure these days, if he had a, you know, ruthless manager, right? I, I think he probably could have patented the whole thing and made he, a lot of money. He, was but a true, but he wasn't, he, he wasn't in it for the money. And I think that he found a lot of joy in life where people with millions just don't. And he, I think he was aware of his addictions and his demons. The, the other thing he did, which, um, which quite tickled me outside the club one night, I'd been playing on stage with, and I had Vicky Stillwell, who became very famous dog um, expert. It's me or the dog. Do you remember that show? And she'd turn up in her leathers and that, get angry with people on council estates for giving their that, dogs is, ice cream. Is that the one that used to, to smack the dogs? And get, uh, you know, the really posh lady who was always on crust. No, that I don't was that? know. Do you remember there was that, that lady, who... Barbara Woodhouse? That's it, Barbara Woodhouse. No, this is this is oh. no, no. Victoria did did her thing in uh, very much uh, sort of more attractive looking person, but she was she was she sang really well. So I got her to come and sing, mm -hmm. so that me and my mate Tom could concentrate on the guitar playing, and we were doing pentangle stuff, wow. and I was actually on stage at the 12 bar and I just was, you know, heads down and she's starting to sing stuff. <laughs> the Cruel Sister, right? So have, have we got a photo of, the, of her? Do we have a photo? I think there's a picture of the two of us in black and white on the stage there I'm playing. Black and white. Let me just, let me just. It's just, it's just the two of us. I just wanted to say hello to her if she's watching because she's done so many great things for the welfare of dogs. Um, what she's done with her life is is remarkable. Sorry. I'm, um, I'm glad she was there. Sorry to associate the her with the um, Barbara Woodhouse. Sorry about that. No, she's. I'm not. I'm not an expert on. on... Here we go. That's us. So that's the forge and that's the stage. And it really is. It's so small. That's me looking, trying to look like Davy Graham there. But I'm, I'm actually kneeling. That's your Yamaha. Uh, Ibanez guitar, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's the one. And I was kneeling on the floor um, next to her because there was simply no room for another chair. And there's just behind our heads is the arch of where the fireplace used to be. And it was called the forge. And somebody's, you know, cut something out of a cornflakes packet. That became the 12 bar club and so that's me and vicky on stage there while we were playing while i started playing this bert janch piece and i looked up and five feet away from me is bert janch really and he dropped when? down he, he'd come down to the club at davy's suggestion to check it out and he ended up taking over davy's residency there for another couple of years and that helped to relaunch bert's career there was the live at the 12 bar album and then people, you know, the pop stars like Bernard Butler and Johnny Marr started singing his praises. And Bert had another great career mm -hmm. boost, which Davy didn't have. And I think that Davy still had his... I remember that night I was outside the club and um, 
you know, in, in the days when I smoked and unfortunately, you know, I wished I'd never had, but Davies, Davies, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I was stood outside. I don't remember if it was loaded or not, but Davy was there and he'd done the whole kind of, you know, you're always slouching, just there he is, all robust, muscular. You know, he looked like some Australian g guy that had just come out of the outback with this amazing tan. So this is, this did, is Davy Graham playing, where, where was he playing? In that's country. at the black that's the night i met him at the at the um black horse in um rathbone place it's above mm -hmm. uh, what was the black horse pub and i think it's now a burger joint called you know dead cows are us uh -huh. or something like that i don't know can i say is this in elephant and castle is that that folk club in elephant and castle because no 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 this this is just off um oxford street rathbone right. place is where yeah oh what's that i ought to remember that uh ivor Morant's um shop is is on that road oh right okay yeah I know that. and then it's further oxford street oxford just yeah and f and further down that road is the folk oh what's it called i'm terrible I know it. I know it, yeah where they sell all the folky instruments yeah um, got hot goblin hobgoblin hobgoblin is at yeah. the end of that road. really yeah. recommend going to hobgoblin Brilliant. if you uh, um, americans if you ever come to london go to oxford street ivor marriott's very famous shop there and then just if the it's road. Yep. if it's still there you know i, I don't know if ivor's is still there but we stood outside, the, stood outside the club, and Davy's mm. kind of dressing me down, and he grabbed the cigarette out of my mouth, right? Right. And I thought he was going to throw it on the floor and and mm. crush it with his foot, and he shoved it in his gob, <laughs> and then, and then in one he had these amazing lungs, this really big chest, yeah. and he did the whole thing in. <sighs> You know, like God, kind of the way God breathes at the, what's that film, yeah. the, you know, and he did this thing of just like, took the whole lot in, did it all in, and then one of his eyes started to dance and kind of look up, mm -hmm. and the other one was looking straight at me, and I didn't know that one of his eyes was glass, right? Oh, really? So, like Raikuda? He got, well, I don't think it might have been, he got blinded in one eye, so I'm, I didn't know which eye to look at. And he just yeah, went yeah, into yeah. this, he started ranting at me about something or other, and I really wished I'd recorded it, because it wasn't the ravings of a nutcase. This was just amazing stream of consciousness stuff. Mm. And I just, again, I I was so young and silly. I just didn't, I, one was aware, one was in the presence of someone remarkable. It was just this untapped resource of amazing wealth and knowledge and wisdom. I think and, he'd uh, um, learnt the oud in this photo he's playing the oud here and i think he'd learned uh -huh. that in, i think maybe that was an algerian because i've got a lot of algerian friends that play oud um and they live yeah. in a few algerians that live in london and yeah maybe it was his trip to algeria i think he went to algeria i think he that. seemed to feel more comfortable playing those kind of things than the guitar and like i said i never saw it i never saw him play a steel string guitar in all the time i knew him and one one time i was waiting for him to turn up in 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 andy's guitar shop lovely summer night and um the shop was closed but i, I was going to be playing that night as well and we were waiting for davy mm. and I'll, I'll never forget and it's one of these lovely memories of mm. you know like i was saying about people that you just know that they're someone special and this black cab pulled up in the street outside and i looked and it was davy and he was in there it was a bit like this room mm -hmm. inside the, the 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 passenger bit of the compartment at least five different instruments and he's crammed in there and he's got a couple of guitars he's got an oud some are in cases some are just loose a couple of mandolins um tons of stuff and i just went running out to help him and i was and i'm i'm bringing the stuff in and are you all right he said well i just i couldn't make up my mind and i wanted to play this and i wanted to play that mm -hmm. and he didn't have anyone to help him so he got a cab from lime street in camden town down to to denmark street and um and I just remember looking out and he's trying to pay the cab driver and he'd probably been in the cab with the guy telling him that he had an engagement tonight at a wonderful new place and mm -hmm. telling him all the stories about the club and it's mm -hmm. it's near this place where they used to load people up to take them to the Tyburn tree for execution and they'd say he's had his last drink, he's on the wagon, that's where that phrase comes from. You know, he just he knew all this stuff. And um I just remember the cab driver, and you never see this in London. Cab driver just said, "No, nah, it's all right, mate. That's on me. Have it on me." Really? Waved, waved the fare because he maybe, knew. Maybe, maybe he knew who he was. Even if he didn't know who he was, he knew that he was somebody. If yeah. you're going to let someone off your fare, yeah. this guy was—he's clearly struggling. He's probably yeah. not got a lot of money. He's somebody. Which is crazy. Important. 
How it's can important, he not have, you know. I mean, this is what this is what is crazy. The situation is, he was living. You know, he didn't have much wealth, but you know, he 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 kind of like he, he, you know just that tuning dad gad. He brought that to the guitar world. You know, all these guitar players sort of were influenced by him, and and he well, was struggling. It's just ridiculous. In some ways, he was a lot of he had good neighbours. Mm -hmm. and people loved him in that street and they all james hamilton was a neighbor he's a really nice guy and they all kept an eye out for him and i think also his rent was possibly capped there's no way he could have afforded to live there you know now with with the rents the way they are in london and people people always took it upon themselves to try and look after him and help him i don't know if throwing loads of money at, at someone is the answer but i do think it's no. really unfair that he didn't get a the recognition and b mm -hmm. just the remuneration that he deserved because we've all got to have money to live in this world, whether we like it or not. That's Absolutely. maybe not, yeah. you know, it's not the way it should be, perhaps. But and and he he um, was born he was born to just play guitar. That's what you know. I, he was a troubadour. I, you know, I, I mean, I mean, the, the word troubadour is it's got a bit of a history to it, obviously. But mm. he was in the sense that he was he was just going to be playing from one gig to the next, go from one gig. That was his his life. Yeah, one I think so, and I, I I and I think also he was luckily he was aware of how important he was yeah. and i remember one of the last times i saw him in that that part of my life um when i was still sort of uh youngish early 20s and i remember i was working in wimbledon this is one of the one of those nights when i couldn't get the night off work and i was working in off license and it closed at 10 o'clock in wimbledon village davy graham was booked to play at the troubadour where he'd done his first ever gig with john renborn on the bill and i was thinking I've got to get to this. And I remember just cashing up, pulling the shutters down, locking the thing, running down Wimbledon Hill, getting on the tube train, doing that thing of trying to hurry up train, hurry up train, running down the Brompton Road to get to the Troubadour. And I'd sent my friend Alistair along, Crawfee, along, you know, tell me what happens. You know, you start without me. And apparently they hadn't had a really good night. David had not been playing great. He was struggling. And John Renborn was on fire. He was at the peak of his powers and playing all these meticulous, beautiful pieces. Mm -hmm. And it had been like Christ a chess, genius. kind of like a chess game, though, really, because I think that they both still had enough of an ego, not in, not in a nasty way, but they were both very aware of being at their best. And Davey had been struggling all night and it looked like John was going to win this game of chess. <laughs> I turned up just in time to get down into the basement to see them struggling through something or other. And then they were taking it in turns. And John said, well, I'm going to play one of my pieces. John Renborn mm -hmm. played something like Lady Nothing's Toy Puff immaculately and beautiful and with a harmonic thing at the end. And oh, everyone's yeah. like, whoa. Yeah. And you could see now this we've only got 10 minutes left of this gig. And this is so sad. And like I said, Davey would never play Angie. And I, oh, I hope I don't cry when I mention this story. But <laughs> he just said, well, I think I better play one of my pieces then. Mm -hmm. And he started playing Angie wow and um god you could have you could have offered to put me anywhere else on the planet in that moment and no this is where i want to be mm -hmm. i'm in the troubadour it's saturday night i'm 24 mm -hmm. davy graham's on stage and he's just started playing angie oh my god that was worth it you know worth the hell that i went through to get here you know when I was at school, in a miserable school, having a horrible time, I, I thought if I could have imagined being somewhere in the state of being, anywhere in the world, I mean, this, I mean, I'm home. I'm home. I'm here now. This is where I want to stay. You know? The benefit that, oh, it was a magical, magical the, moment. That. The benefit of, um, you know, somebody like David Graham not becoming super famous was that mm. he was very accessible. Yeah. And he had that he had that trump card and it was checkmate game over yeah. he'd won he'd won the game and john renborn sitting next to him you know when they do those award ceremonies and then yeah. they show the face of the person that's lost and they're having to kind of <laughs> smile at john <laughs> renborn's because yeah. no matter what john renborn had done and his career yeah. was magnificent it's it we're, we're nearly coming yeah. you know he he didn't have angie no didn't and davy graham ha had <laughs> angie which had started the whole and it was just davy's way of gently <laughs> respectfully saying I'm the man. Um, and John Renborn, to his credit, <laughs> always used to say to me, Davy's the man. And he meant it. And, yeah. you know, Renborn had his piece, Judy. Do you know the piece, Judy, which was. Um... No, I don't know. Am I still on? So it's... Yes. Well, Judy's possible. <laughs> something like that 
that. No, it's very, which is, it, it, I mean, it's a female it was, name and it's similar. It's, no, it was deliberate yeah. um, Take, homage yeah. to, to Angie and then, right. you know, other people have had, and I think that, you know, um, Donovan would have been playing that in, in, in India, mm -hmm. you know, playing Angie and, and teaching the yeah. Beatles how to finger pick and George Harrison yeah. would have probably gone. <laughs> While my guitar gently we That's where that stuff comes from. Without Davy Graham, exactly. so much of the music yeah. that we all know and love, and people mm. are influenced by it whether they know it or not. You know, the, um, yeah. I mean, even Bert Yanks used to play that, you know, what I was playing earlier, the... Oh, yeah. Bert Yanks yeah. used to, used to yeah, do Yeah, well, I mean, he, he, he took an old um, traditional song, Black Waterside, and and Davy fired it. He basically put it his guitar and dadgad and did his own, again specific, yeah. unique and completely original, almost mm. uh, copyrightable version of it, which maybe other people got hold of and made a bit of wedge, you know. Um, but there we go, James. Now we got no. a few. We got a few because we're we, we, we're I'm a little bit conscious of time here. We have got a few audio pieces you've sent me. Do you want me to play you? Um, um, well, I'd, yeah, I'll just. Piece? I think if you play Dave, if you play a bit of Hey Bud, this is Davey absolutely at his peak in the 60s playing the Big Bill Brunsey instrumental, but doing something remarkable with it. Just the dexterity. And he didn't even know he was being recorded. This is um, after a gig at a university in 1964 or five or something. And, and it was just an after gig party or a gathering in one of the in one of the dormitory rooms. And somebody was there recording it. Um, Okay, so let's let's try and play this. So there's a bit of chit chat going on in there, but um You'll have to turn it up. Yeah, I can't hear it. That's I mean I would recommend anyone to go and check that out. It's um I think it was at Hull University. And he'd done his set there and then he just they'd retired for a sort of soiree afterwards with a few friends and he started jamming along i don't think he knew he was being recorded but this was just him in, in full flow and again i don't know you we seem to be having technical problems do i need to turn off original sound or what do i need to do no no it's okay okay I tell, I tell what, right so we can hear this james james you uh, i don't know why you're not hearing this but i, I can for some reason Fine. Let me let me play okay. it, play it again. Um, this is incredible guitar playing, guys. This is yeah. This is a big it's, an, it's a simple hey, piece hey. of blues music, but yeah, what it's he hey, does with it. Hey, 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 big Bill Brunson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's hear this again. I know. I hope. Okay. Hopefully, this is going to. I'll through. I'll shut up as long as people can hear it. That's all that matters. Okay, so let's play it again. Here we go. Okay, so that, that I mean, was an amazing guitar that, playing. That's what? quite something. And again, this yeah. was just, he, his, he was loosened up, he was relaxed, and he was, 
Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. No one could touch him. No one could play like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's as a guitar player where I just sit back and go, Oh, hallelujah. You know, I, I might as well just give up, but this is such a lovely thing to listen to just the pure, the pure joy, the, the life in that, in that music. He was playing nylon know. strung there, wasn't he? It sounded like nylon. No, no, no. This is that steel string. I think, I don't know. Okay. I think so. He, he picked up the, um, there's a picture I've got of him here where he, in the seventies, he got into playing the, the nylon, the nylon strings and, and he wouldn't play anything else beyond that. So, so um, what year was that, 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 that piece? You, that you recordings from the, from the sixties. Oh, right. I see. Okay. Yeah. You know, it, that's, that's, that's him at his absolute peak. Um, it's available on CD. I think it's called live at Hull university or something like that. Wow. And then I recorded a couple of, um, just gigs that I went to, mm -hmm. he would play a bark piece followed by a fat swallow tune followed by a song from the west country followed by something from afghanistan or something you know he without missing a beat and it wasn't pretentious he just he didn't really recognize borders let's he just listen, loved great music you know let, let's listen to a little bit of this uh bark because i'm quite interested in this so i'm gonna okay let, okay it, it's quite a long piece so just play a little bit yeah yeah um let me just see hopefully guys at home you're going to be able to hear this let me just do this yeah now. Here we go. Okay, I mean, yeah, and he, he had a lovely tone and a lovely feel. And in terms of creating a beautiful atmosphere in a little club like that, you were sort of, he, he wasn't as dexterous as he used to be. But it didn't matter, you know, people that were going along to see, it'd be a bit like getting George Best to play football in his 50s, you know, he'd do things on a pitch that other people wouldn't think to do because he was a genius, but he wouldn't be able to keep up with the other players. And I think Davy was so damaged with the drugs and various other things that it was, um, impossible to to think he also had arthritis um right. afflicted by 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 that and i think it was unfair to expect him to be able to be people don't like it when people get old do they because it makes them feel old but i just loved being in his presence i, I really I, I loved i loved hanging out with him it's just one of these problems is that you think these things are going to be around forever and i've been up in denmark street recently and it's heartbreaking because everyone's gone the clubs are gone the people are gone and it's Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm so glad that I managed to to pick up a little bit of that. You know, well, what was, how did he end up? What what, what was his? Um, because there was a documentary that came out that gave him a little bit of uh, notoriety. But after that, how, what happened? What happened? I don't really know. It's all a bit it's all a bit muddy and murky. And I think that he ended up quite ill. And um, <sighs> one of the stories I heard was that his girlfriend Carol. And again, I don't I don't want to tread on anyone's toes because it's a sensitive subject. But I did hear that she grabbed hold of his ashes and went up to Scotland and scattered them in the Highlands. And I thought, how oh, wonderful. One last road trip. And, you know, it might have upset a lot of people in the family. Again, this is someone else's business, not mine. But just as a kind of last hurrah, she thought, yeah, I'm going to liberate him up. There's something he'd have loved. Yeah, let's go up. Yeah, come on, come on. Let's a bit like that Grand Theft Parsons where his mate you know, the film about Graham Parsons and his mate steals the body to burn it in the uh, Joshua tree and uh, the family are furious, but there was a, like a pact and understanding. Like I said, he had people around him that loved and cared for him. Um, but no, I only saw him one more time and it was so brief. And I gave, I gave him a CD of um, Ali Farker's music and I'd given Ali Farker a tape because he only played cassettes of Davies. And I just had a feeling that they were the only the only hey, peers man. on the planet you know that's an incredible thing that you've done there there were the only two people that yeah. i considered to be peers on the planet and i said that to yeah. davy and i hope he listened to the record and they both they both mm. gone now and it's it's a shame that they didn't meet because i mm. in stature and in terms of what ali was doing just yeah. naturally fusing western music with his own music and mm. and just playing great music and being a maestro as a player playing things that i still can't even imagine being able to there really was no one to touch them. They're the two 
finest musicians I've ever met in my life and probably the two most fascinating. I didn't get to know Davy as much. You know, when you, you really feel you've got nothing to offer someone, I thought, you know, I could go and hang out. I feel with like that guy. every day. No, but seriously, I was I was young and and I hadn't I didn't know anything of the world and but you know not what? really, and I just thought, well, I have got nothing to offer this guy. He needed someone to spar with that was you know uh, yeah, on the yeah. same level as him. Well, you and it's that... a lonely being that incredible having yeah. that kind of mind. It's a lonely yeah. place to be. But you know what though? You know? There's always the, the kind of the mentor student thing. And when I met Peter Green, I, I was I was. Um, you know 23 23 22 23 mm -hmm. and and i think you know him he, he must have been about you know over 50 maybe mid 50s or 50 or something yeah mid 50s and he, he would have been yeah. and he, he wanted to talk to me because i was young you know had i been my age now he probably wouldn't have been interested yeah. in. but when you're young yeah. you know a, a, an older musician it's like you know who's this young young guy you know you're going to be interested because someone young you're going to give them that, that time of day because they're young Whereas possibly if yeah. older coming to you like you know whatever. maybe what was, no, you wouldn't be like that i, I certainly what, wouldn't but you know. was was your girlfriend pretty she was an essex girl and she was extremely beautiful that's probably why he's wanted to talk to you if you were with <laughs> i thought it might have been something to do with that you know? yeah no i'm just <laughs> kidding now that was a joke for liam he'll get that <laughs> he'll enjoy that but um <clears throat> no that that is true i think there's something about it's it's really weird. I remember I used to go to this club with my mate Tom. He was the best guitar player that I knew, and he still is. Um, but we were both young, and I remember just being in that alleyway where the club was and walking around the block and having a chat. And then we got to the other side. We were looking down the alleyway, and the only two people in the alleyway, apart from us, were Bert Janch and Davy Graham, having a catch-up. And, and honestly, we looked at them, and they looked at us, and I, I thought at the time, they're probably thinking that's what we were like and we were there going that's what we want to be like mm -hmm. it was a really weird weird moment you know just seeing the two of them there together in, and, and seeing Bert and Davy together and seeing John and Davy together and I felt you know like with Pentangle I used to go and see them separately because they'd split up and I was talking to the guy that plays this stuff the best in the country is a guy called Darius Kanani right He's he's oh, that inherit, the inheritor. He right. well, when Jackie McShee was playing with Pentangle on the Isle of Wight anniversary gig, she chose him as her guitar player. And he's a young guy, but he must be. He's I didn't even, I don't even know. Was he's he in the documentary? Yet. Was he in the documentary? No, no, no. This no, he wasn't. But he got to know John Renborn, and John mentored him and taught right, him okay. and looked after. Just in the last couple of years, we're coming up to John's anniversary. Um, next week he'll be gone for six years and Darius was a young guy that went along and mm -hmm. John gave him the torch almost and if yeah. you hear Darius playing now right. he's just an astonishing player so the music continues we'll put a link we'll put a link um, in the comments of the, of I think he's someone that you should chat to if you want to if you want a top level yeah, guitar love to. Love player yeah. he's somebody that will be able to play you these pieces and yeah. and it is like a responsibility and you've got to have a clear head and a yeah. conscience about it and he's He's a, he's like the three of them in one. You know, he's, an, he's living in Leeds, so I've got to go and hook up with him soon. But he's someone to talk to. Um, but yeah, it, it was like catching the tail end of something wonderful, and it was like catching the tail end of those guys in the, in the nineties and going to their gigs. It was a bit like I used to always turn up at parties when they were just finishing, mm -hmm. and you could tell this had been a great party. You could see the carnage everywhere, people oh, lying all over I the place. Didn't, the get, I didn't even get invited to the party. The empty cans, the <laughs> mascara running, because all the girls, their boyfriends have got off with all of their friends and someone's playing, this is the end, you know. But it was like that, going to these clubs, you could tell what it was like in the 60s and how great it had been. Oh. And it's something that you have to then nurture because it doesn't exist anymore. So in terms of somebody like Darius, you have to be the thing that you love because yeah. there will be people looking up to you one day saying, what was it like in 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 the corona well, the, the, well, we to you, all that covid <laughs> stuff what was lockdown really like granddad yeah james we, we've got to go we, we, we've run out of time now um well, I bet we have. <laughs> this has been amazing because um i can't edit these videos it is what it is no i'm sorry to yabber at you but just, i'm good at yabbering and, and sorry to interrupt james no 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 <laughs> this is this is the man that's the man there he is and uh Luckily, you know, his. I think you, it's still possible to get hold of, of course, some of these cool things on, on vinyl. And yeah, he was he was a nice fellow. So there's so many more things I could say about him. But I did I did love him, and um, mm -hmm. I'm so glad to have met these people because it's 
now when the way things are now and how depressing it all is to have that as a resource in here it's somewhere i can go to at night and just remember i was there and and you, there. you know there were um, good times and good times will come again and you know okay. we're next time we got, and we, we've got the music to to enjoy absolutely mm -hmm. and next time we meet james um we're going to wrap this up now but the next time we meet james we're going to talk about peter green and his mm. his time with this splinter group it might be a little bit controversial maybe i think um, it'd be good to talk about them and you know, and we're not going to make his, it we're not going to sensationalize it though no his solo career uh, as it as it was maybe is yeah. an interesting one because you know there was yeah. colors and there were a bunch of other bands and in the sky peter green and on. peter green and friends was the last band he was in and mm -hmm. He did. He did. He played some really amazing stuff towards the end in the last yeah. sort of few years of performing. So yeah. that that's it's going to be an amazing chat. We're going to meet up next week, and we're going to continue these little chats. And uh, I'm going to continue interrupting your flow as I normally do. No, it's all yeah. right. But I just, I just, yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I, I want to. You know, I'm going to get I, complaints I, again. You know, I'm it's di get it's again. difficult talking about someone like Dave because <laughs> there was this documentary that was supposed mm. to be out, and I really hope that Steve, the the director, is going to be yeah. able to get it to get it finished because you know great. money's an issue and covid's an issue and it's a film it's a, a wonderful film mm -hmm. um it's called davy graham the man with the guitar and in whatever form it comes out it must be yeah. seen because i think that we owe it to him all of us to remember who was the man and he he was the man davy was the man davy graham if, oh, you, yeah, yeah. If, if you if you're watching this guys and you made it to the end here and you, you <laughs> Davy graham <laughs> by that album do you want to show that first album? Do you well, there's um, the, the folk blues, folk blues and beyond. This is the I album think... you need. This is no, this is. Oh, it's down here. Hang this, on a minute. This is the album you need to have in your collection if you are. Well, like yeah. Tablet. Well, there's there's folk blues and beyond, and then there's also some really good compilations. There's one called A Gentleman and a Scholar, which is um, right. a compilation of sorry, a compilation <laughs> of different different that, tracks. That, there's that's, a lot. Yeah, that's that's the album though. You know, there's a lot of stuff available online but i think it's it's I, I don't know who who the money would go to hopefully it'd go to cindy or one of his family members um but yeah it's important to remember okay then guys it's um goodbye from james my lovely thank friend. you thank and you mate it's goodbye from me and uh, we're going to see you next week and we're going to be talking about peter green so take care guys god bless and see you next week goodbye yeah keep the faith